Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Fagan Maradian here at the Center for Naval Analyses, one of the nation's leading think tanks, a federally funded research uh, and development center, to talk to my good friend Sam Bendet, uh, one of the nation's leading Russia analysts and also an ex expert on Russian uh, unmanned uh, systems. So a whole series of explosions <laughs> happening in Russia uh, over, uh, and unfortunately, and I don't mean that jokingly because there has been loss of uh, life, uh, at least at one of, one of the two, even though I think details are sketchy. One is a uh, was a massive ammunition dump in Siberia that Correct. exploded, Correct. Uh, where uh, Russian unmanned vehicles are actually playing a key role fighting right. those fires, and there were two explosions. Uh, and then there is the explosion uh, in the north off of Arkhangelsk, right. which uh, U.S. officials believe could have been the test of a new nuclear uh, weapon. Uh, I know details are sketchy on that, New York Times obviously covering it. Um, talk to us a little bit about what we know about the northern explosion and then the one that we know about the Siberian explosion. So the explosion explosions. The explosion in the north uh, supposedly took place following a test of a new missile. Uh, Russians are saying that the fuel um, uh, inside the missile has exploded following the tests. And that has affected the staging and the launching area, and that's what killed several employees of the organization testing them. Supposedly up to five people have died. The details are still sketchy, um, and there's a lot of cleanup activity are taking place there. Obviously, if there was any nuclear fuel involved, Russians are going to be very tight-lipped about that. And uh, and that's right. We don't know whether or not there was any nuclear uh, material involved in this, even though U.S. Uh, officials suspect that there, there, there could have been. Not officially. Russians are not saying officially that any nuclear fuel or material was involved. Um, and do we think that this was a hypersonic weapon? Do we know have any sense on what kind of weapon it was? It's hard to gauge right now without any additional details. Uh, let's go to uh, the, the double whammy explosions that we saw uh, in Siberia. Uh, tell us what the facility was and the role of unmanned systems are playing in, in the recovery of that. And the facility near Anchinsk inside Siberia was an ammunition depot. It was supposed to be decommissioned by the year 2022. So there were a series of explosions. The initial explosion, which looked like a mushroom cloud to the observers, and, and you could see that actually in videos, took place on August 5th. There was a follow-up explosion following a lightning strike on all the um, ammo that was probably s still there on August 9th. So right now there's a lot of cleanup for a lot of, other, of, a lot of unexploded ordnance. Uh, Russians are bringing in military sappers and the demining forces, and they're bringing with them along technologies that they've tested in Syria, and that is the Uran-6 demining vehicle that we talked a lot about. Uh, they're also bringing with them Uran-14 firefighting unmanned vehicle as well. There's an opportunity probably for them uh, to bring other vehicles depending on the size and the scale of that cleanup. Um, you mentioned uh, Uran, and uh, obviously uh, the Defense Minister Shoigu uh, visited uh, the Russia's leading tank plant. Right. Uh, a lot of interest. You've talked about a T-72-sized unmanned combat uh, ground vehicle. Talk to us a little bit about the latest on that. So a couple of years there were um, interesting rumors about an unmanned ground vehicle based on a T-72 chassis uh, that would be used specifically for urban combat. So this would be a heavily armored UGV in several models um, that would be specifically designed for operations in cities, probably based on what the Russians have learned in Syria. So this week, Defense Minister Shoigu is visiting Ural Zavod, which is the main tank manufacturing plant in the country, and he was actually shown a, um, a model of that UGV. So not much more is known, but the fact that Shoigu is actually looking at that is probably very interesting. Uh, and uh, another interesting development is uh, Ochotnik. Uh, right. uh, talk to us about Ochotnik uh, and remind the audience what that uh, system is and why it's so important. Right. So lots of interesting news coming out about the Russia's largest and heaviest unmanned combat um, aerial vehicle, UCAF. Ochotnik is supposed to be a stealthy 20 to 30 ton uh, UAV that is supposed to be used for intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, and possible strikes. It was in, um, in the manufacture in various stages of manufacturing for quite a while. Uh, the Russian Ministry of Defense promised that this year there would be a first flight, and so on August 3rd, this stealthy Ochotnik blended wing designed uh, UCAF took to the skies for about 20 minutes. It flew at an altitude of about 600 meters, and then it landed. And so this is a significant breakthrough for Russian manufacturers and designers of heavy UAVs. Russian Ministry of Defense has stressed the need for such machines in service. But um, for many other projects of its kind, the timelines were delayed. And so it's significant that this was the first actual flight for this UAV. Several more flights are planned 
towards the end of this year. And the end goal would be a completely automated flight. So this UCAF is designed to be either operated from the ground or perhaps as a loyal wingman to Russia's stealthy aircraft so that it could either penetrate enemy air defenses, conduct strikes, and fly other missions. Uh, you know, it's it's interesting that in some of these uh, systems, as usual, you know, the Russians end up actually being, uh, you know, matching our thinking, if not even being a little bit ahead of it in terms of uh, the conceptualization, as we found even throughout the Cold War, there were things that the Russians did before we did them, uh, and then we adapted uh, adapted in kind. Bring us up to speed on some other uh, developments. You know, you're tracking what the Russians do worldwide, operationally, uh, whether it's on undersea systems or, or air systems or ground systems. Give us an update on where we are on some of the other programs. Was it it's, it's really a, a renaissance period uh, in terms of uh, Russian unmanned capability. That's correct. A lot of government investment is put into that uh, technology. The Ministry of Defense is very interested in that. It is uh, supposed to acquire about 300 UAVs annually for the next couple of years. Uh, that way, the Russian UAV military fleet would be one of the largest operational fleets in the world, possibly second only after the American. Uh, towards the end of this month, Russia will host uh, an air show, MUX 2019. And usually at uh, various air shows, military expos, um, exhibitions, there's a lot of activity related to all kinds of technologies, and the manned technologies are going to be presented there in force. So a lot of manufacturers and developers of UAVs specifically are now planning to present their technologies at the MOX air show. That would be very interesting uh, to see how they're thinking about civilian and military use of UAVs, what kind of designs they're using. Now, um, last month, uh, Russia hosted uh, an Army Expo. That's the actual title, Army 2019. It's supposed to be Russia's largest military expo and one of the largest military exhibitions of its kind anywhere around the world. Um, and there, Defense Minister Shoigu actually called for the Russian defense manufacturers to step up and complete the import substitution drive. In fact, a lot of announcements were made that certain technologies would be acquired only if they're made with the Russian high-tech parts uh, without any Western or Asian or other imports. Um, so uh, as part of the development of the Russian concepts in uh, operating unmanned aerial vehicles, Following the Army 2019 Expo, this week and the prior week, Russia, along with many other countries, are hosting Army Games. So this is a major international competition. It involves many former Soviet states. It involves China, India, Iran. Uh, and the competitions are taking place not just in Russia and in former Soviet Union. They're actually taking place around the world. And these are competitions that involve all manner of services. So for example, uh, Russian intelligence forces are training and competing in India. Russian mechanized forces are competing in China, Russian divers, the military divers are competing in Iran. And so um, Russia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Iran are now part of a Falcon Hunt UAV competition. Now, we talked about that last year, and this year the competition is heating up. Russians are presenting a much improved version of their short range Eleron 3 UAV to compete against um, very good teams from other countries. Um, there are mass demonstrations against Vladimir Putin, and I'm not going to ask you a political question because that's outside your purview, but Russia has been under a lot, the government's been under a lot of pressure, uh, and some of these demonstrations are obviously freedom-related, but some of them are also economically related because of uh, sanctions that have really hurt the Russian economy. Uh, Russia has been trimming its sales, even on defense investment, uh, ultimately because it's got pension challenges and a whole bunch of economic issues it's dealing with as well. So it's done some targeted investment. Is there a sense at all that these demonstrations could actually manifest themselves in deeper defense budget cuts, especially if the administration, the Russian administration and Putin and his team feel like they've got to somehow do put some economic stimulus or spend more money uh, on citizens as opposed to hardware. So a lot of defense spending has already been pre-assigned, and so the last couple of years uh, the defense spending has actually been flattening out because a lot of key technologies were already acquired, investment was already put in into various modernization stages, and the acquisition and purchasing is already taking place. Uh, it is unlikely that Russia would reallocate significant funds away from its military budget towards other causes. Um, it is, however, likely that some of the defense industries may be under more pressure to deliver the results for which they were already paid. Part of the import substitution drive that was championed by Moscow starting in 2015 after the imposition of Western sanctions was the domestic manufacturing of all key components for the military. And so a lot of defense enterprises, a lot of defense companies were paid a lot of money for the development of such technologies. Now with the potential of some kind of um, um, 
some kind of decrease downrange, not necessarily immediately, but perhaps a downrange. These defense companies and these firms have to deliver. So one example uh, that we discussed last year and earlier this year was the development of the Altius Altair long-range UAV. It was supposed to be another heavy uh, vehicle. Billions of rubles were spent on it, but not much, unfortunately, has been shown for it. In fact, the, um, the manufacturing entity that is developing this UAV is plagued by scandals because of all kinds of accusations of mismanagement of money, the misallocation of state funding. And so that's a good example of what the defense companies in Russia probably shouldn't be doing. If there is going to be any kind of pressure um, going from the top, uh, down on other entities in the country, such as uh, defense enterprises, then there will be a lot of uh, pressure on those defense enterprises to actually deliver the products that they were supposed to design and on schedule. That's very important because a lot of these uh, projects are actually beyond schedule and the schedule has been shifted way to the right. Uh, is the cleanup drive uh, working, right? I mean, there have been a lot of allegations that uh, a lot of this money has been siphoned. I, I remember how Laberinti Beria used to solve some of these problems, which were a little bit on the aggressive side. But I mean, are there uh, proceedings that are going on against some of these companies in order to be able to uh, drive the kind of output that you know, any any state at the end of the day wants to receive from its contractors? Right. There's always something happening. There's always news about this this type of corruption scandal or that type of corruption scandal. In June at the Army 2019 Expo, Defense Minister Shoigu said that the import substitution drive has largely completed for many defense enterprises and the wheat was separated from the chaff, meaning a lot of the companies, a lot of uh, factories that were working on things that they couldn't deliver or claim things they couldn't actually deliver have been probably shoved aside in favor of those that could actually work on certain things. Now, the real picture is a lot more complicated. Russia still depends on a lot of high-tech imports. How they're going to substitute all of that and within a short time frame is unclear. But um, it is unlikely that the protests would be uh, diminishing the uh, amount of funding spent on defense in the near term. Uh, you know, I, I thought of you at the Royal International Air Tattoo because there was a Romanian MiG-21 mm. uh, that was the product of, uh, you know, good old-fashioned Russian engineering. The airplane debuted in 1955, right. uh, and it's amazing to see that it's... 58, I think. 50, 58. Yeah, 55, I think it was first flight in 58, but something like that, right? It dates from the 1950s. It's still in operational service. There are a lot that are in, right. in service, and then thanks to Israeli and Western avionics, the design is, is still makes kind of an effective fighter, so I thought of you. Well, it depends who the fight is against, <laughs> obviously. I mean, a lot of countries are moving away from that older MiG-21 style time frame, um, uh, flight frame, rather. Um, but uh, yes, for certain missions, um, I mean, a lot of countries are still flying turboprops, right? Uh, World War II style designs. The Super Tucano, the Brazilian aircraft that everybody wants for counterinsurgency ground attack operations, is essentially a modernized World War II fighter. So uh, it's not about the airframe, it's about what's in it. And you were right, Israelis and the Romanians have modernized their MiG-21s extensively. And in fact, Russia also had its own modernized MiG-21. It was called MiG-2193. It was the last lineup of modernized MiG-21s, which was then, um, uh, you know, essentially retired in right. favor of other or more modern aircraft. Uh, but the airframes are usually solid. It's what's in it and what they're used for that matters. Uh, that's right. Put a couple of good missiles on it. But yes, it's not going to win any turning dogfight, even though it turns well, I think, for its time. I think it's right. a little bit dated uh, today. Sam, it's always a pleasure. Thanks very Likewise. much. Look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you so much, Fargo.